One more comment from the forest rangers now came to mind. In addition to keep to the right and follow the signs to Camp Squanto, the ranger had inspected the site map for 15W carefully and said, Oh, that one. You probably won't be able to drive a car back there. Great. Just great. I parked the car in the grass across from the site 15W sign and relayed the ominous remark to the team. They decided to walk to the site as the word road didn't seem to apply to the dirt swath a foot or two wide. Maybe it was a bicycle path, since there were no signs of horse droppings. After several hundred yards and in the middle of thick woods, the trail dropped sharply downward. This looks bad, said Von Baltz. We don't want to be in a hole. Ahead loomed an area that clearly would be a wet weather stream and a muddy mess for days after a rain. Now it was caked bone dry. On the other side, the ground began to rise and regained all the lost elevation over another 200 yards until the path emerged into a large open field. Someone had cut out the trees at some point. The area apparently was mowed periodically. Baby pine trees, two feet high, with trunks an inch thick, had started to regrow. We continued into the clearing and saw the WRTC antennas, along with the tent that was set in the far end along a tree line. Two men waved as we approached, undoubtedly really finally to meet other human beings, especially the team that would be competing from their site. Michael Bennett and his son Derek had been at the site for nearly two days, securing it following the beam team's installation of the tent, large tower, and antennas. The father and son were pleased to see the team, and the feeling was mutual. It was clear that the trail was drivable, at least with the husky pickup truck the Bennetts had parked along the far tree line. With this information, I volunteered to retrace the nearly third of a mile back to the road to see if our sporty Dodge Charger with a full trunk could navigate the so-called entrance to the site. As I walked back, alone along the trail, or whatever it was, it was certain that someone or something had cleared the path. Side branches that normally would have obscured the trail had been lopped off. A few of the larger limbs were substantial, an inch or more in diameter. These would rub against any vehicle passing through. That was certain. But if I could keep the car centered, the path might be wide enough, maybe with a few marks on the paint, maybe not. The decision was never in doubt. Back on the road to Camp Squanto, the car started up with a flare and crossed the road into the narrow opening, otherwise known as a forest pathway. Certain portions were absolutely glen-like with lovely ferns, but in other sections the stiff ends of the branches rubbed against the side panel and made squeaks and high-pitched abrasive noises, and small stubs of decapitated baby pines grated against the car's undercarriage panels, making a combination of funky thumps and throaty brushing sounds. At the slope down to and across the wet weather swale, the road was rougher, with small stones and chipped bedrock. But nothing was too bad, even for the American muscle car with a large storage trunk and well over 200 pounds of complex radio and computer electronics. At last, with a bit of personal triumph, I arrived and parked the car with its trunk end facing the competitor tent. Elvis, in the form of the precious payload, now was, almost, in the building.